Last week, we started the second half of the book of Daniel, uh, and these final uh, chapters, this final half of the book, are probably the most controversial and complex passages in all of Scripture, paralleled possibly only by the book of Revelation. Uh, And so it's interesting, and there's a lot to try and make sense of, and I'm going to continue to do my best to try and um, communicate some of these great truths that this book has for us. Uh, So last week, we went through Daniel's first dream, uh, which involved four uh, unusual creatures emerging out of the sea. Uh, So by way of reminder, if you missed last week, uh, let me introduce you to the lineup. Uh, Creature one is a, a lion with an eagle's wings. Creature two is a bear. Creature three is a four-headed leopard with wings. And finally, the star of this dream is the beast. Um, And as you can see, they represent four different kingdoms. They represent the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Grecian, and Roman Empire. Uh, And so that's what we went through last week. So if that's all looking a little bit odd for you because you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to catch up on that message. Uh, In an effort to be fair in um, how I went through this, I did mention uh, that there are some wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ who believe that these kingdoms are future kingdoms. So they don't believe they're the Babylonian, Grecian empires, etc. And there are good reasons why they think that. Uh, However, I hold the view that these are actually ancient kingdoms. But I I did want to make sure that I communicated fairly um, on this point. Uh, I do believe they correlate to Daniel chapter 2. Um, but I don't want to kind of re-go through the whole thing. So the fourth creature we have here is known as the beast, uh, now which is the Roman Empire, but it is unique uh, in that further kingdoms seem to extend out of it. Uh, so although I, did, I, I made a few comments about this guy, but I didn't uh, go through what these horns represented, these ten horns, Uh, these 10 empires that that manifest or come out of the beast seem to represent future nations. So although the beast represents the Roman Empire, there also seems to be a future uh, kingdoms that seem to extend out of it. Uh, And they, they appear to be nations that are right at the last of the last days. Now, uh, obviously, the last days technically started at the day of Pentecost, right? We've always kind of been in the last days ever since the inception of the church. But this, the, that these ten kingdoms, these horns that we see in this dream seem to be a characteristic of just before the tribulation and during the tribulation. And so we cross-reference Daniel 7 with Daniel 9, Matthew 24, and Revelation 13, and this help us understand what is going on with these kingdoms, and so that's what we're going to go through today. So let's pick up where we left off last week. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Daniel uh, chapter 7, and I'm going to start reading from, I think it's 19. Let me find it here. Yeah, we'll go 19 to 27. Uh, Then I desired, this is um, Daniel speaking, just had a vision. All right. "Then uh, Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped out what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up, And before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and the mouth that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the ancient of days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, 
As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth and shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it into pieces. And for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten horns shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and he shall put down three kings. And he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away and be consumed and destroyed to the end and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Okay, a lot going on there, so let's go through it. Verse 19, Daniel says, I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast. So Daniel seems to have some uh, specific interest in that fourth beast, as do we, right? The, the other, as unusual as the other characters or the other um, kingdoms or creatures are, it is the fourth beast that is exceedingly terrifying. And then in verse 20, it introduces a feature of the beast that captures our attention. It has 10 horns. Well, that's, that's odd. Very, animals don't have 10 horns. Well, I don't know of one that does. And then that, and then once those 10 horns appear, another horn, which is described here as the little horn, and that little horn comes out of this creature, and it absorbs three of them, or it subdues three of the horns. Well, this is all very unusual, and it is interesting. So what's going on with these horns? Let's talk about these 10 horns here for a little bit. What do these horns represent? In Daniel 27, verse 20, uh, sorry, 27, Daniel 7, verse 24, it says, And for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. So this, this helps re remove a little bit of the abstraction that we have here, a little bit of this imagery. These ten horns, they're kings, they're kingdoms, or empires, or nations. These are kind of synonymous representations so as we continue to go through this text, um, try to envision kings and nations rather than horns, right? Because when you're handling analogy or when you're handling symbolism, the sooner you can shift, from, shift to what is being represented, uh, the better. We're talking about kings, right? You, kings, kingdoms, uh, presidents, whatever the modern day version of, the, of kings are, we're not talking about horns, right? We've got to kind of move on from that a little bit. Uh, and by the way, horns, uh, they are not random. Uh, this is not a random symbol. Uh, horns are often used in prophetic scripture to depict world leaders. That's kind of a characteristic of Bible prophecy, um, not to mention a horn in the Bible is used to describe, it's a symbol for strength and authority. So this is in part why God is using horns to depict kingship and strength. So these ten horns, uh, that, that's who the ten horns are, right? That's these ten nations. But what about this little horn that emerges? That is none other than the Antichrist. No, it's not. I, I feel like it's bad timing on Mother's Day to talk about it. <laughs> um, the Antichrist and the beast. That wasn't intentional. Um, <laughs> so what we're seeing in this passage is some of the major players in end times prophecy are being introduced to us here. We've got these 10 nations. We've got the Antichrist and, of course, Jesus Christ. Uh, the only other key player, I think, in the end times is the one they call the false prophet. Um, he's a, a key uh, individual in the end times, but because he's not mentioned in Daniel, we're not going to talk about him, but just know that he is in the mix as well. So we're talking about some of the other key players in this end time roster. Um, so let's keep moving here. So 
when, when does this take place? When will these 10 kings and this little horn uh, come on the scene? Uh, so this is the part of the prophecy. The, the first part of the prophecy is in the past. And this is the part of the prophecy where we have to jump ahead all the way to the tribulation. And this is not an arbitrary leap forward. Uh, there are, there's other scripture. We're cross-referencing other scriptures that help us and give us insight and shape our analysis as to what's going on here. Uh, I had mentioned this last week, uh, that one of the um, interpretive necessities uh, of eschatology or Bible prophecy is you have to synthesize Scripture. You have to bring it together. You need to take one biblical passage and you need to hold it against another to give some high resolution to what we're trying to see. Um, an example of that is we have to harmonize verses together to understand faith and works, right? You read just one verse about works, and like in James, or one verse about faith, and you could go all in on one of those, but we harmonize those together, and these multiple verses come together to form a very uh, key, key doctrine. Um, and that's an important part of this whole process, and same is true. With Bible prophecy. It's the culmination of verses. That ha that's how we come to a clear understanding. Uh, a couple of key verses, like I mentioned, Daniel 9, that's Daniel 70 weeks. We've been through that a few weeks ago um, for Palm Sunday. Matthew 24, and of course, the book of Revelation, Daniel's uh, counterpart, so to speak. Let me read to you the key passage from Revelation in chapter 13, because this is the most prominent and useful cross-reference I think we have regarding these ten horns. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns. Diadems are like crowns. And blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear and its mouth were like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months, three and a half years. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemy, blaspheming against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. There's a lot of familiar things going on in this verse, right, from what we're reading in Daniel, so clearly this is expounding on what Daniel wrote in, seven, in chapter 7. And Daniel's vision is expounding on Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so what we're seeing is more details coming in every time. In fact, when we jump ahead to Revelation 17, we get even some more details. And so that's actually a really key characteristic about Bible prophecy is that it repeats and expands. That's really useful for us to know because in John's revelation, right, in the book of Revelation, that is about 600 years after Daniel's revelation. And you will notice that there was a beast that came out of the sea in both, right? There are 10 horns, a leopard, a bear, and a lion, You've seen the similarities here. They've got, they're talking about the same thing, right? The little horn is described as a beast in this passage. And just as with Daniel, the little horn, as does the Revelation beast, they both blaspheme God. Uh, you'll notice that they both talk about 42 months or a times, times, and half a time, right? Three and a half years. And although that time, times, and half a time is a, a odd or very cryptic kind of phrase, uh, 
when we, when we do a word study, we can understand that that means three and a half years. We'll go through that another time. But, I, but, but by overlaying and harmonizing these verses, we can see that Daniel's dream, this latter part, takes place in the future and correlates to Revelation 13, what we just read. So what do we know about these 10 horns? We might as well try and figure out what's going on with these 10 nations or these 10 empires. So they represent um, some type of confederation, some kind of alliance of nations that's going to happen in the future. And this correlates also with the 10 toes of the statue, right, uh, from Daniel chapter 2. Now, likely, this confederacy will involve nations in Western Europe. Um, which was territory once occupied by the Roman Empire. Because remember, the fourth beast in Daniel is, represents the Roman Empire, and these ten horns come out of the Roman Empire in the future. And historically, Rome has never been ruled over by ten kings, so that is something that is unrealized in history and is yet to happen. So this points ahead to the last days. Uh, this confederation will likely take form just before the tribulation. Um, this means you and I may will see it take form. If we're, if we're around for it, if it's 100 years from now, then you're doing well to watch that take form. Uh, this confederacy or this alliance of 10 nations is something that global politics has been converging in on in recent history. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't know who these 10 nations are. Uh, if, depending on if you jump on YouTube and everybody's got, everyone's a scholar on YouTube, um, a lot of people propose who they think these 10 nations are. We don't know uh, who they are. So uh, be tempered with your guessing game on that. You can guess. It's kind of fun to think about, though, isn't it? Uh, obviously, the European Union. Uh, is an example of what this could look like. Let me just say clearly, I'm not saying it is, <laughs> but I'm saying that is a type or an example of what it could look like. Uh, there are a couple of attributes of the EU that captures our attention. Um, they have some really questionable buildings. Uh, for example, the European Union uh, Parliament building is a replica of the Tower of Babel. It's odd. Isn't it? That makes you think, right? You can go check this out for yourself as well. The European Union Council building has a statue of a woman riding a beast, which immediately puts our mind to Revelation 17. Now, they're not basing it on the Bible. In fact, the, the building that looks like the Tower of Babel, it's based on some 16th century artwork, and the woman riding a beast is probably based on some Greek mythology of Europa or something like that. So they're not pulling it from the Bible but you can't help but see it as a, uh, uh, some kind of allusion to what is yet to come. Uh, the European Union is in the process of, of developing its own army. Uh, they have their own anthem. The, so they are primed and positioned to be a great candidate for what could be an end-time coalition. Now, let me pause right here and just say those previous statements about the EU, this is my opinion. Um, I wouldn't go telling everybody about this and putting it all over social media that this morning at church we got to the bottom of the ten horns. <laughs> I'm using it as an example to highlight the plausibility and how close we are and how it really could. You, if you brought this up you know, 200 years ago, it's hard to imagine. So this 10-nation alliance, um, although it sparks that interest, it is less interesting than what is going to follow these 10 horns. Da in Daniel's vision, or his dream, he fixates more intently. He leans into this vision because he saw another horn. So you've got these 10 horns. You see this other horn emerging out of the beast, this little horn. Okay, so what do we know about this little horn? I mean, I've already told you who it is. I don't, I'm trying to build the suspense here, and I just remember, remembered. I've already told you who it is. It's the Antichrist. Let's pretend I haven't told you, and you're all leaning in like, who is it? 
So although the little horn had an insignificant beginning, he's going to emerge, he's going to subdue three of the kingdoms. I don't know what that looks like. Does he remove them from the confederation? Does he literally conquer them? Does he just absorb their kingdoms? But we see this little horn, this antichrist coming out of this beast and taking three of them. So we don't have to know much more than what to describe there. So who is this antichrist? We've all got... It's fun to think about who the antichrist is, right? Uh, Now, before we get into this Antichrist conversation here. Two things. One, there's, there's, there's two ways we have to understand the Antichrist uh, and how it's used in Scripture. One is it is a spirit of Antichrist. That's one context that it's used. And then two, it is a person who is known as the Antichrist. These are both true. These are parallel truths. Uh, with what we are reading here in Daniel... We are talking about a specific individual, a literal man. We are told that he'll be energized and controlled by Satan. And now he isn't Satan, but he is possessed by Satan. Satan. Uh, Throughout the Bible, uh, there's a few different titles used to describe this guy. In Revelation, he's called the beast, as we talked about. Of course, Daniel, he's the little horn. And in 2 Thessalonians, he's he's called the lawless one, the man of sin, the man of perdition. Uh, These are all terms used throughout Scripture to talk about the same person. Uh, Interestingly, the the word antichrist is only used once to describe him, but it's the most fitting. It's the most appropriate name to call him, and that is why it's ubiquitous throughout the church to describe this person, this individual. We call him the antichrist. So the beast... Uh, in Revelation is the little horn in Daniel. And I also want to draw to your attention that in chapter 8 of Daniel, the next chapter, there's another little horn. And this is, this is, I'm really trying to not confuse everybody here. This little horn in chapter 8 is not the same little horn as what we see in chapter 7. Uh, And so we need to understand that the symbolism is unique to its own context. All right, so sometimes when we're talking about the little horn and we're talking about the beast, we're talking about the same thing. Sometimes when we're talking about the little horn, we're not talking about the little horn from chapter 7. Okay, so it would seem that the Antichrist is probably a political leader. Um, He will be an impressive man. Uh, He would have to be intelligent uh, because he's going to have solutions for economic and global problems. Uh, His influence is probably going to be accompanied by some military prowess or some military acumen. Um, We would assume that he's probably an engaging, charismatic guy with some charm. Uh, Now, we we, we kind of draw to those conclusions. The Bible doesn't clearly state his personality type, but we assume the type of man that he has to be in order to lead and bring about this one world government effort that he's going to make. And remember, this is the guy that's going to negotiate and implement a peace agreement, a seven-year peace agreement, and of all people between the Jews and the Muslims. That is uh, trying to get cooperation in the Middle East between those two groups is no easy feat. And so this guy, whoever he is, he is able to do that. So what is the mission of the Antichrist? What's he trying to do? Now, we may not know much about who he is, but we do know what he's trying to do. We know the given specifics about things that he will try and, of course, what his destiny is, which is not good. His his ambition is to rule the world and to to usher in peace. That's going to be his, his campaign. That's going to be the feature of his um, political effort that draws people in. Uh, here are the highlights of the Antichrist um, diabolic career. Let's go through a few things. Uh, one of the first things to, to happen, which is interesting, is he is going to have an apparent death. 
there will be an assassination attempt on him. We've read this before, right? There's going to be a mortal head wound, right? Uh, so there's going to be an attempt for his life, and it will seem like he's dead. Now, this is described in Revelation 13. We are told he's going to suffer a head, a head wound. And then three days after this assassination attempt, he will appear to come back to life. I keep on saying appear and seemingly because I do not believe he is actually killed and I do not believe he actually is resurrected from the dead. Some people do come to that conclusion. I don't think we need to go there. Uh, so with this apparent miracle and with his political skill set, he is going to establish himself as a world leader. He is going to be the dominating force of these 10 nations. And then... Halfway through, this seven-year peace agreement that he has initiated, he's going to break that agreement. He's going to prohibit temple sacrifices of the Jews, and in some way, he's going to desecrate the temple. He is going to demand that everyone take his mark, and we all know this, right, as the mark of the beast. He's going to persecute those who have become believers during the tribulation period, which is ultimately going to lead to his fate. Jesus Christ will return and defeat him. Jesus will judge the nations, and the millennial reign will begin. All right, so that's a snapshot of some of what the, on, what's on the Antichrist um, to-do list. Um, let me make a couple of comments about that. There's a few things that I think are interesting with pausing on. Um, that peace agreement that he's going to coordinate in the Middle East, tensions in the Middle East represent the longest standing into international conflict in world history. And the root cause of this conflict is real estate. This is all about Jerusalem, God's holy city. It's a claim to the city. This is the most hated city by Satan. It is where the temple is. It's where Christ is going to come back. And so that's the spiritual undercurrent of why there's so much tension in the Middle East, specifically Jerusalem. And this technically goes all the way back to the tension between Ishmael and Isaac. Anyway, so the Antichrist is going to bring together Muslims and Jews which is going to pave the way for the Jews to once again have their temple. There is, there is a Jewish organization that are waiting for this day. They have everything they need to reset up the Holy of Holies. They have all the uh, equipment and things, that, the, the veil that they're going to put in. They are ready to go. They are waiting for this moment when they can build their temple once again. And interestingly, it's going to be the Antichrist, this guy who's going to negotiate to allow them to do that. But then halfway through, he's going to prohibit the sacrifices and he's going to just uh, do something completely sacrilegious to their temple. Maybe sit on the throne of David. We don't know exactly what it is. Now, if you've been to the Temple Mount, who's been to the Temple Mount here? Got some people that have been to Israel? It's a great experience. It's a weird experience. It's a weird feeling up there. I don't know if Anyone else felt this? But it feels uh, dark, like there's a darkness there. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, I mean, I, it's a great experience. There is no Jewish temple up there. There is only a mosque by the Dome of the Rock, that gold top mosque you may have seen pictures of. In 1967, or at the end of the 67 war, uh, the Israeli Ministry of Defense minister, uh, Moshe Dayan, um, he negotiated a peace deal with Jordan where he allowed Muslim Jordanians to administrate control over the temple. Because you're thinking, why wouldn't Israel have a temple on the Temple Mount? They don't, they don't administrate it. They don't have control of it. This was something that was negotiated coming out of the 67 war where they allowed the Muslims and the Jordanians to control that. That is why. And so the, the, the Muslim community, they regulate excavation and everything else. And we, 
uh, we, when I say we, the Jews and um, other scientists don't have, or uh, historians don't have access to dig around and see what's really going on there. Now, this decision in 1967 was a disastrous deal. This was a terrible decision for that gentleman to have made. In fact, to this day, Moshe Dayan has no statue and no portrait or anything in all of Israel. He is hardly a hero, a national hero. That's just to give you a sense of what the Antichrist is coming into, seeing the Temple Mount, seeing the Jews, seeing the, seeing the Muslim, think about all the war and conflict, missiles going backwards and forth, for, 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 forever. We don't even think about it anymore because it's just par for the course for the Middle East, that conflict. And he's going to come in and he's going to settle that and he's going to handle it. The Antichrist will make war with the saints and prevail over them. In verse 21, it says, As I looked, this horn, this little horn, the Antichrist, made war with the saints and prevailed over them. He goes on to say in verse 25, he, she, he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given to his hand for time, times and half a time. And again, it's three and a half years. So God is going to permit and allow the Antichrist to persecute uh, believers during the tribulation. But this is just for a season. Because after that three and a half years, Christ is going to return and he's going to uh, destroy the Antichrist. Okay, so in order for this all to happen, there needs to be, there needs to be global crisis. For all the, everything I just kind of went through there, uh, things need to look a certain way internationally. For this even to be plausible, such, there needs to be such global distress that a one world government or confederation would be a desirable solution. There needs to be complete global economic failure and that leads to famine and civil unrest. The immorality of mankind needs to spike again, just like it did in the days of Noah. This, was, this will destabilize and polarize the nations and people and people groups. And this will increase the need for international governance. Now, although nations will likely maintain some autonomy... Uh, they will need to cooperate and function within some international system. Now, this all sounds like conspiracy, doesn't it? This is wild. You have to have drunk the Kool-Aid, right, to truly believe that this is on the horizon. If you're not a believer and you're hearing this for the first time, if someone's watching in on this message, we have just been categorized as a cult, after going through all this. If we hadn't seen what we've seen in the past few years, with what we've seen unfold in the past two, three years in particular, it makes the, this conceptually plausible. This, this puts much of what's going to happen in the end times, it puts it in reach. You know, 50 years ago, a lot of this couldn't even be conceived of how it could play out. The, but the idea of government controlling travel and trade based on the compliance, whether you have a vaccine passport, that helps us envision how this could all play out. That's not a statement about the vaccine. That's a statement about control and how easily we can get into a position where we have no choice. If we want to trade, if we want to buy and sell and eat and travel, we need to be under the compliance of some international regime. You don't have to use your imagination much. It's not, your imagination is not strained to imagine this. It's not even difficult to imagine the mark of the beast concept. Remember 50 years ago when your parents were talking about the mark of the beast? They were saying to you, 
don't get the number 666 tattooed on your forehead, please. <laughs> right? And you're like, okay, mom, I won't. And it was never something you would have ever considered doing. But now we can envision how, what this could look like and what a, a mark could look like and how it's going to be a necessity to integrate and function in this world. So who is this guy? Who is this? Um, let's go through some candidates here for a long list. I actually know who it is. So that's good news. I'll tell you, you'll get, get your pen ready. It's going to be awesome. All right, here are some of the honorable mentions of uh, <laughs> people that have been... Uh, obviously, the Pope is a popular one. Uh, Martin Luther thought it was the Pope. Many people think it's the Pope. Uh, some think the Pope is going to be the false prophet or whatever. Okay, so that's one candidate. Barack Obama was pretty popular. Uh, Donald Trump was, I think there's some um, Instagram pictures of him uh, being the Antichrist. Adolf Hitler certainly was a great candidate in people's minds, wasn't he? Uh, lately, I've seen Elon Musk's name floating around. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, sure. Um, this is all conjecture, right? We don't know who it is. Uh, and it's likely that people who are alive at the time when the Antichrist does um, become present and we know who it is, the chances are people are going to be surprised about his identity. I mean, it's fun to think about, and when you think about people like Hitler or whatever, you think, oh, yeah. Like, I could see how someone like him, when you think about, ah, uh, should I say this? Okay, <laughs> oh yeah, got permission. Uh, <laughs> you take someone like Donald Trump, who I don't think it's Donald Trump, but he was able to negotiate peace and stabilize conflict between some, between, with Russia and China and in the Middle East, right? So you can now think, okay, yeah, I could imagine someone coming in and, and doing that. And I'm not saying it's any of those people. I truly don't know who it is, and I don't think any of us should be guessing. Um, we can assume that he will be from the region which was formerly the Roman Empire. From Scripture, if we think that fourth beast is Rome and the little horn comes out of it, okay, so it sounds like he comes from the West. Uh, so we can deduce that, so it's that means it's not going to be Russia or, or Israel uh, or some other parts of the world. So we can know a little bit, um, but I would encourage you not to spend any time trying to figure it out. The Antichrist is going to be the ultimate counterfeit for Christ. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians that he's going to claim to be God. Now, you've got to keep in mind the word anti or anti uh, means against, but it also means instead of, instead of Christ and against Christ. I think it's both true about this character. Not only is he going to be incredibly hostile uh, against all things pertaining to God, he is actually going to attempt to sub in for God. Uh, let, let me mention a few comparisons between Christ and the Antichrist. I mentioned a few, a few moments ago that he's going to receive a head wound, he's going to appear to die, and then be resurrected three days later. Where have we heard that before, right? He's going to have his version of that. He's going to seek to unify a broken world. Well, that's achieved through Christ's return, not the Antichrist. He will desire to rule the world. Again, that's Christ's jurisdiction in the millennial reign. He's going to be part of an unholy trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, mimicking once again the holy trinity. Just as Jesus Christ is the image of the Father, the Antichrist is going to be the image of Satan. Jesus came in the name of the Father. Antichrist comes in the name of Satan. And Jesus warned about those who come in his own name. Now, Satan has always wanted to be worshipped. That's how he began his career, right? Trying to trade places with God. That's always been his thing. 
Um, he's finally going to have his chance <clears throat> and have a short reign for three and a half years. So he is going to counterfeit Christ in a number of ways, and eventually he's going to be sat down, he's going to be destroyed once and for all. So with all his treacherous and disturbing antics, he is going to face, you know, he's going to meet his fate once and for all. If the Antichrist mission is a tribu- is in the, unfolds in the tribulation, and we are good pre-tribulation rapture folk, aren't we? <laughs> okay, I know you, there's some post-tribbers here. Well, you know, post-tribbers do need to think a little more about this Antichrist character. <laughs> um, but why should we, if we're not going to be here for the tribulation, so why should we concern ourselves about him? Why, we're not even invited to this party. Why would we spend all this time to figure out who this guy is? Now, I had mentioned earlier the concept of Antichrist to be understood in two ways, the spirit of Antichrist and the person of Antichrist. And although we may not experience the Antichrist's earthly reign, we do experience the Antichrist in a spiritual sense now. In 1 John chapter 2, I'm going to read about nine verses here. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have, been, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know this truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as has taught you, abide in him. And so we understand that, yes, there's a coming Antichrist, a guy. And remember, this is written by uh, 1 John, which I just read from, is written by the same guy who wrote Revelation. He had not yet had the Revelation vision to see a lot of what he saw about the Antichrist, the beast, but he's aware of it because he's aware of what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He's aware, he's read Daniel, he's read the prophets. He knows that there's some guy. And he's saying that guy is coming, or he's the Antichrist. But hey, that spirit of Antichrist, it's in play right now. And so this passage does give us some urgency, uh, and, it's, and it's both a warning and a command. And he is speaking to the children of God. He is speaking to you and I. He is bringing the future entity of the Antichrist, and he's bringing it into this current age. The spirit of Antichrist has been at work since the inception of the church. The spirit of Antichrist is hostile against anything of God. And in the same way that we, have, we experience Christ right now in a spiritual sense and we await his, the, the person of Christ's return in the future, we have the spirit of Antichrist at play and we await for the embodiment of that in the future. So in this short letter that John writes here, he reaffirms the core of Christianity. He says, look, we've got to exhibit sound doctrine Obedience and love, he characterizes these as what all Christians should have, even suggesting if they don't have it, that they're not true Christians. See, the spirit of Antichrist is, a, is the constant assault against truth. 
In verse 24, when it says, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. Well, firstly, this is regarding the deity, Jesus, uh, the deity of Christ, and that salvation resides in him alone. That's fundamentally what it's saying. But we can extend this out to refer to the fullness of what we believe and who we are called to be. The, the Antichrist, that spirit, is committed to attacking your relationship with Christ. He is the, he is the enemy, he is a deceiver, he's aggressively trying to distract and distort truth. That's what he's trying to do right now. He's trying to, just like he's going to do in the tribulation where he's warring against the saints, he's attacking them, he's persecuting them, we, we deal with that now. That spirit of Antichrist is warring against us. He's trying to deceive us. He's prowling around. He hates God's people, and he is going to be diligent. He is going to work very hard to cast doubt in your life about biblical truth. That's If the Antichrist had a business card That's what it would say, to cast doubt and bring lies about truth. That's what he does. And that's what he's at work doing right now. He's the Antichrist. This is, again, not a good illustration. Remember the little cartoon devil that hangs around here? Maybe that's from, like, Mickey Mouse or something. Uh, But he's just chirping away, right? Feeding you lies, casting doubt, causing you to question everything causing you to question your salvation, causing you to not believe the work that God can do in your life, taking everything that's true, everything that is of Christ, everything that we hold to and believe dearly, he looks at that and he's just constantly feeding you another narrative. And we have to resist that. We've got to resist the Antichrist as he chirps away in our ear. There's a couple of ways I want to encourage you with this. Um, First is you have to be an aggressive ambassador for truth. That's what John is saying. He's saying, hey, the truth about Christ, everything that you once heard and was in you, protect it. Fight for it. We have to be ardent defenders of what is true. We have to be non-compliant with heresy. We have to be uncooperative with error. Truth truth is the antidote to the spirit of Antichrist. Now, if right now, whoever the Antichrist is, that guy, he came out of this room and he stood up here right now and he told you to do something. He says, take the mark of the beast. He says to you, deny Christ. Is anyone here tempted to do that? No, we're not going to do it, are we? Because we're going to be uncooperative, we're going to be non-compliant, we're going to be unwilling, we're going to be immovable, right? That's, of course, what we're going to do. If the Antichrist, he's walking around, he doesn't see you fall into that trap, he's going to say, well, listen, do me a favor. Would you at least accept that maybe the Bible is not the inerrant word of God? That's reasonable, right? You might think, oh, well, I mean... Maybe I want to be cooperative or whatever, right? No, you're not going to do it. It's so easy to envision what it is to take a stand for truth, to be uncompromising, to be unwilling, when the Antichrist is parading around, throwing requests out there, trying to solicit your buy-in. You would take a stance, and you'd say, no way. I stand in Christ. I abide in Him. And all your little hot ideas and tips on life, not doing it. Right? But listen to this. That is what we're doing, because the spirit of Antichrist is doing just that. Why? Because he doesn't have a human body? It's just as real. So how are we to live? How are we to regard the spirit of Antichrist in our life? We have to remember that we need to be soldiers. We need to be militant. We need to be defenders of the faith. And we don't uh, tolerate and listen to anything that is anti-Christ. And we don't follow or buy into something that is instead of Christ. That is what this whole thing means to us. 
Now, yes, it culminates and comes together as the ultimate expression and the Antichrist in those final days. But for now, we are still interlocking with the enemy. And I would encourage you to fight. And to, don't give up. Don't give up in what is right. You know, what, you know what your life should be. You know what is true. You know the things you should be working on. You know the sin that's kind of there or whatever. Fight for those things. Because the spirit of Antichrist is trying to downscale all those things and say they're not significant, they're not interesting, they're not meaningful, everything's fine. Be intolerable to anything that is anti who we are in Christ. Such a great prophecy that we see here. And it's not one uh, a friend of mine um, would always say about prophecy that, you know, prophecy doesn't come to scare us. It comes to prepare us, right? And this is actually encouraging because you can make sense of what's going on. When you wake up in the one morning and you get an alert on your phone and it says, 10 nations are meeting together to discuss a single currency, something... <laughs> You'll look at it and you'll be like, ah, okay. And you'll go and have your coffee because you're waiting for that anyway. It helps us understand what is going on. Church, we are in the last days. We don't know when we're going to stand before the Lord. My encouragement to you is to fight. You know, love is war. And we battle for the things we love and the things we care for. And we rage against these things that try to rob us of the joy and the freedom that we have in Christ. So keep fighting. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning, um, Mother's Day, together as a church family. Our kids are out there learning about you and having fun. We get to be together and we're free to do so. We're blessed, God, and we just, I don't know, want to have thankful hearts. And we walk in your joy and we're this morning, and we walk in our confidence, in the confidence that we have that you are the victor in this story called mankind. So God, comfort us, strengthen us. May your Holy Spirit convict us. Oh, it would be a shame for any of us to lead. Uh, sorry, to leave this morning without feeling challenged by you, God to be better, to honor you, and to do more for you. So God, we thank you so much for all you're doing in our lives and in this church. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, you can stand. Let's close in a song.